has been uh, like uh, two weeks, maybe less than two weeks that the United Nations Security Council authorized uh, what it called a multinational mission for security and stability for Haiti. And it called it a non-UN mission, which would be nominally headed by Kenya, but it fulfills something that the United States had been demanding for a long time. It's that another invasion of Haiti, the um, 10th one, who knows. And the announcement has been denounced by various organizations, including the Black Alliance for Peace, whose open letter condemning this UN-approved invasion of IT was signed by Orinoco Tribune. So, like, I am from Orinoco Tribune. And the fact and that... And Liberté. And mm -hmm. Haiti Liberté, of course. And the fact that an African country was selected to lead an invasion force into a Black-majority country has been called by you, Kim Ives, Haiti Liberté, the blackface on a U.S. Canadian effort to invade Haiti. So thanks for being here today to discuss the implications of that resolution as well as what this new invasion could mean for Haiti and its people. Mm -hmm. Kim, Kim Ives is a journalist, a documentary maker, and an authority on Haitian issues. He is a founder of the weekly newspaper Haiti Liberté, where he is a writer and an editor. Previously, he wrote, edited, and photographed for Haiti Progress for 23 years. And he has also written for many other publications, such as The Guardian, The Nation, The Intercept, The Progressive, Jacobin, etc. And some of his uh, well-known documentaries include Bitter Cane, uh, Aïsien Leve Campe, The Who Continues, Killing the Dream, and Resistance. His uh, most recent work is the documentary series, Another Vision, Inside Haiti's Uprising, jointly directed with another journalist, uh, Dan Cohen. And Ives is a member of uh, Crowing Rooster Arts, a film collective specializing in films on Haiti. And he is a founding member of the International Support Haiti Network, formerly the Haiti Support Network, and has led numerous delegations to Haiti since 1986 to investigate human rights violations, uh, union struggles, land conflicts, and state enterprise privatization schemes. And Ives is uh, uh, one of the four pundits in the very popular Creole language uh, two hour Sunday afternoon show, uh, Haiti and Ondes Serum Verite, broadcast on Radio Pano, based in Brooklyn, uh, New York. He is a also a frequent guest on the radio and TV programs and shows, including Al Jazeera, Democracy Now, Russia Today, CCTV America, National P Public Radio. The Hill, the Real News Network, Tarkish TV, and Radio Sputnik's two shows, By Any Means Necessary and uh, Political Misfits, and also many Pacifica Network and Progressive Radio Network programs. So thanks a lot for being here. And uh, like if you are ready, we'll directly jump into it. I am ready. I um, should maybe just uh, d d silence my phone. I hear it pinging. I just don't want us to be interrupted. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Okay, so. Are you done? Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. So we'll just start with like, what does this United Nations Security Council resolution? authorizing this multinational mission for security and stability for Haiti mean? Like what are its, what does, what did the UNSC say about its aims and the duration of the operation? Well, uh, as we know, the United States has been using the UN as its uh, front or as its fig leaf uh, for the UN's entire history over the last almost 80 years, as we know, beginning with the Korean War. Um, and in fact, they were able to use the UN as a fig leaf in the Korean War because uh, China was represented at that point by Chiang Kai-shek's Taiwan, where you are now, Saheli. And the uh, Soviet Union had briefly uh, boycotted the Security Council. So they were able to ram it through. And uh, as we know, we have gone through now seven decades where the US pre preeminence as the 
world's superpower has grown, particularly since the uh, fall of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s. And uh, during that last 30 years, really the US has almost had its way with the Security Council. And it was in that sense that they were able in 1994 and 2004 to fairly easily pass through this UN Security Council uh, the uh, uh, resolutions to establish UN uh, peacekeeping forces in Haiti, even though that's a flagrant violation, as we repeatedly pointed out, of the UN Charter, which says that UN troops are only to be used for the maintenance of international peace and security. That is, that is the conflict between nations, between India and Pakistan, or between uh, Russia and Ukraine, or, you know, they are only supposed to be used to prevent wars, but they're not supposed to be used for internal conflicts, for civil wars, for revolutions. The UN is not supposed to be meddling in those things. Uh, but the US has found a way with its proxy here where I am in the Dominican Republic, often providing the uh, cover of saying, you know, our peace and security are threatened by the Haitians uh, fleeing their country next door. Um, but the fact is, what's happening in Haiti is a slow motion revolution, in our opinion, and it has no effect on the um, peace and security of the Dominican Republic. So the UN has now uh, been hamstrung by the fact that since February 2022, we live in a multipolar world where the war in Ukraine emerged. Russia and China have uh, built their alliance, are building uh, an alternative world economy and the US <clears throat> hegemony is very quickly going into a nosedive. So the UN had to improvise for this particular intervention into Haiti, which is a very important uh, pawn in its geopolitical chessboard. And uh, they understood that Russia and China uh, were very uh, opposed, or at the very least leery, of their designs in All right, back. I'm so sorry. No, no, you it's, know, it's not your fault. Third world problem here. Uh, yeah, it's not your fault. Yeah. Uh, so where did I cut out? I think I said uh, I'd got to Jamaica. Uh, uh, oh, 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 I think your internet is breaking again. Mm. Okay, the internet connection seems to be okay. gone. Can, can oh, you the see me? Yes, yes. I can see you, but it's. I think it's very unstable. So, if uh, so, we've gotten to Jamaica. No, no. Actually, I mean, we probably did, but I did not hear that. <laughs> okay, so good. I was just. I. I will tell you what. What we were. I. To what I heard. 
that China and Russia were, mm, uh, they, they were at least uh, skeptical of it. They're skeptical of the U.S.'s designs in the region. Right. So the 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 U.S. Uh, the um, Russia and China mm -hmm. were pushing back in the Security Council against the request of the U.S. puppet in Haiti, Dr. Ariel Henry, the de facto prime minister, for foreign military intervention. Uh, they invited myself on uh, December 21st, 2022, to speak against it. Uh, and they themselves, uh, primarily the Russians, the, the Chinese less so, uh, offered uh, strong skeptical and sometimes condemnatory statements against U.S. designs in Haiti with this intervention. Um, so uh, what they did was they went to various countries, the U.S., uh, trying to find a proxy because the U.S. did not want to take the lead. And we'll get to the reason why they didn't want to take the lead in a moment. But they didn't want to take the lead, so they asked Jamaica, they asked Canada, and finally, they asked the Kenyans. Now, I am recently returned uh, at the beginning of September from a trip to Haiti, where we were doing an update with my colleague, Dan Cohen, on uh, the situation. And we spoke to a former Canadian uh, who is very close links to the CIA and DIA. And he told me that in addition to the 400 million dollars which are or seen to be necessary to sustain this force in Haiti, the MSS, uh, for the next year. Um, the U.S. has already anted up 200 million of that 400 million. Uh, they also gave a 50 million dollar bribe on the side to Kenya. Now, again, I don't have any confirmation of that other than what this source told me, but given his long, decades long involvement with CIA and DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, for those who don't know, in the US, um, I have, I, I give his uh, remark or his uh, statement a, a lot of credence. Uh, but be that as it may, clearly Kenya is getting something out of it as testified to by the visit of U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin to Kenya in September, on September 25th, where they signed a deal. We haven't yet seen the text of the deal. We have recently been in touch with a Kenyan parliamentarian named Babu Owino, who we've asked to get the text of the deal so we can see exactly what Kenya is getting out of this deal with Washington. But the notion that they're stepping up because of Pan-African solidarity and their feelings for the Haitian people, and um, you know, even <laughs> President William Ruto's outlandishly hypocritical statement that Haiti needs their support because of the endurance it's had over these centuries to colonial oppression. I mean, it's just it, you know makes the mind. Uh, real with with uh, uh, disgust at the hypocrisy, but in any case, so um, so this formula that they came up with to do an end run, as it were, as we say in American football, go around the outside uh, of the Security Council, was to set up a force uh, with Kenya as the proxy, but to get the UN to deputize it, to bless it, to give it its benediction, which is, again, completely outside of the UN Charter. If you're going to have a peacekeeping force, it's supposed to be under the Security Council's uh, oversight and control. It's not supposed to be something that they just say, OK, you're deputized and you can go do what you want. And that's essentially what we have, a completely illegal, uh, unprecedented, UN sanctioned force carrying out war in a country which is not at all to save the Haitian people from gangs. It's essentially, as we've said, I believe on Orinoco Tribune already, uh, to stop a revolution. 
in the revolution is coming from the streets of Haiti, where uh, there is an armed uprising, uh, and they're presenting it as gangs. Of course, all revolutionaries are people resisting U.S. imperialism with whatever degree of consciousness are always called bandits, always called outlaws or terrorists, as we see in Palestine today. Uh, the uh, irony is that um, Russia and China maybe could have vetoed it, but they had, uh, Russia had just vetoed the Mali resolution a few weeks earlier. And in our uh, discussions with them or our appeals to them to veto it, they said it wasn't in their core interests. And I think they just didn't want to take the flack that the US media monstrosity would uh, deal them saying that they were uh, sacrificing the Haitian people for political uh, maneuvering and geopolitical advantage, et cetera, et cetera. They uh, simply uh, sort of bowed out they they simply abstained, and um, we can kind of understand that they they can only use their veto powers as um, you know judiciously as as the the the, the international chessboard allows. Uh, so here we have this uh, force slated to come in, but it must be said that there is opposition growing in Kenya itself to this force coming. And if the US can't get this force uh, from with Kenya's leadership, you know, they're back to square one. What are they gonna do? Now, just to go to the last reason that I mentioned in the beginning of this, that this is really part, and this is laid out in, uh, an article that we began this week and the second part will be next week in Haiti Liberté of a three phase process. I mean, that's our uh, analysis of it to introduce into Haiti what's called the Global Fragility Act. In case we didn't talk about it before on uh, Orinoco Tribune, uh, the Global Fragility Act is a bipartisan law passed in 2019 under President Trump uh, which essentially is a marriage of U.S. soft power and hard power. It is a wedding, a marriage between the USAID, which is an arm of the State Department, and the U.S. Defense Department, the Pentagon. And uh, what they do is they say, we are going to provide you Haiti, the number one fragile state in their view, with food. With food aid, we're going to bring you rice, wheat, uh, oil, whatever it is, cooking oil, etc., uh, to to help you with your economic fragility. But in addition, you of course have a lot of uh, political strife, etc. So we are going to come with U.S. soldiers, special forces, maybe even uh, straight out uh, 82nd Airborne or a 10th Mountain Division to come in and occupy your country. So they can't come direct yet. Why? Because Ariel Henry is a simply uh, a patently uh, puppet of the US uh, appointed by the US ambassador and its allied ambassadors called the core group in Haiti. And he was not elected. He doesn't have a single elected official in his government. There isn't a single elected official in Haiti. And so they realized that they would be building their, their project on sand if they let Ariel Henry do the invitation. They need a nominally elected government to invite them. That is their government, which they figure if they have the occupation in place and they can guard the polling places and they can guard the whole process, they'll have at least the the the, the uh, image of a fair election in Haiti, even if only 1% of the population comes out to vote, which was similar to what happened with Jovenel Moise. I think it was 10% in, 19, in, in 2016. But the idea would be that they 
secure the ground. That's phase one with the Kenyans. Second is they go in and they basically establish a civil society NGO um, class which will support them and take part and be part of the electoral uh, show that will be put on by them and paid for by them. And uh, they hold the election, they get their new elected puppet in place, and he is the one who invites the GFA. And now the, the GFA being, the, again, the Global Fragility Act. And so when the GFA gets itself into Haiti, these soldiers carrying bags of rice on their shoulders uh, coming into Haiti. Now, uh, that is the beginning of the, the contract or the partnership of the GFA is for 10 years. So basically, you have a, a deal to have a U.S. military base in Haiti for 10 years. So one could say, OK, why is Haiti so important? Why would they want to take this wreck of a country and put a military base there. Well, it's precisely because it is a wreck of a country and because right next door is Cuba and right next door is Dominican Republic. And you have to remember that when Cuba had its revolution in 1959, almost all the US industry and business that was based there went to Santo Domingo where I'm sitting right now. And so this is now the new Cuba here in Dominican Republic. And if Haiti, goes Cuban, uh, we could say, or uh, has a revolution, uh, that's going to have a huge effect on this country because so much of the workforce in this country is Haitian. Every construction site, every hotel, We seem to be having the internet problems again. Good God, my goodness. <sighs> so sorry. Oh, yeah. no. at, at least anyway, uh, this time uh, we'll uh, do our best. Uh, yeah. Okay. No problem. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we can understand. Uh, so yeah, I understand. We know Last... actually that uh, most of Dominican Republic's workforce is Haitian. We understand that. You know? Yeah. Okay. Is Haitian. Mm -hmm. So, um, so what has happened now is that in the north there is a river called the Massacre River. Uh huh which is uh, the border between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And the river provides irrigation at 11 points for Dominican farms. Uh, that is, they take water from the river to irrigate the fields of Dominican farms at 11 places. The Haitians began under Jovenel Moise their first a uh, prise, as they call it, uh, means a capture port, a canal, which would bring some water to the Maribaru Plain, which is a very fertile plain in the Northeast. In fact, that's where a lot of the French colonial sugar plantations were originally based. Uh, uh, an American um, sisal plant, sisal was what was used to make rope long before um, nylon became the, the, the go to material for that. Uh, so uh, this area uh, is um, very dry, particularly now. And so they were going to irrigate it. But Abinader, Louis Abinader, the Dominican president, used this as a uh, an excuse to create uh, a big fight with Haiti. This is partially because in May of 2024 will be the national elections. As you drive through Dominican Republic, you see hundreds of posters 
uh, for candidates in these uh, May 2024 20, elections. And Abinader is trying to appeal to the ultra-nationalist, ultra-racist uh, sector of Dominican society, which sees the Haitians as scapegoats, interlopers, invaders, etc. And so uh, he shut the border. And uh, of course, this totally got the backup of all Haitians everywhere, even in the Dominican Republic, and uh, has created huge economic pressure on the Dominican Republic because they relied on a lot of Haitians to come and buy their goods in Dahabon in the north, the town uh, where, near where this canal is being built, which is right across the river from the Haitian town of Wanamant. Uh, uh, it's open two days a week on Monday and Friday for Haitians to come and buy in a big market there, which has been burned two days ago. But uh, in this market, they would sell weekly $1.5 million worth of product. So you can imagine for those merchants and uh, growers who were providing, and, and cement and all kinds of other things too, who were providing material to the Haitians, that this is a big blow to them. And they are rising up against Abinader for this. And so Abinader, may have shot himself in the foot by taking this stance. And the Haitians uh, are refusing a partial reopening. What, what Abinader did two days ago was to say, okay, we're gonna partially open. We're not getting any visas, none of that, but you can come in and buy from our merchants uh, and that's all you can do. And then you go back. And the Haitians said, screw you. We're not doing that. You know, and they're, they're refusing to come. Uh, so, um, this is, there are four points down the border in the north at uh, Dahabon in Elias Pinas, which is on the central plateau. Down by Port-au-Prince is Himani, and in the very south, there's Pedernales. So those are the areas where Haitians and Dominicans often cross and have commerce. And uh, right now, that's all up in the air. But all this has been done to some extent, and I'm going to wind up now, uh, in coordination with the Pentagon, because what they wanted to do was seal off that border to the extent that's possible, which isn't really possible because it's very porous. But they wanted to militarize it, seal it off, put soldiers all along it. There's a force that patrols that border, a Dominican force called CES Front, C-E-S Front. And this is, in fact, a branch of the Pentagon. <laughs> Many people are surprised. I was surprised to learn that, uh, that it's very closely associated with the Pentagon. And their purpose is to seal it off so that they prevent a route for escape by the quote unquote gangs, which they want to shoot like fish in a barrel in Haiti. So. Right now in Haiti, we know that there are about 50 or 60 US special forces. This is well before any uh, clearance to come in from the UN, that they are training Haitian police and they are looking to assassinate the leaders of this revolutionary movement that is being called gangs. Uh, there are indeed gangs, as I always have to point out, but what they are putting in the same basket are the are the armed vigilance brigades, which are fighting the gangs and have a totally uh, different and I could say revolutionary project, which is to overthrow the system in Haiti. So this is the US game. They have to stop the revolution. They have to stop the march of China across Latin America uh, and keep Haiti as one of the 11 countries that recognize Taiwan as China, um, and uh, the, so the, the, the real need is one to deal with the immediate triage, which they need to do. And they're giving that to the Kenyans, who are sons of SOBs in terms of their brutality and corruption, and then bring in the even bigger SOBs, the US military, to lock down Haiti for 10 years. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it was a big. <laughs> 
Like uh, it was a huge answer on covering many things. And I do remember that you did talk about the Global Fragility Act the last time we were on Nore Noka Tribune also. Good. Yeah, I think we, we did. We also talked about uh, countries of Africa and also Papua New Guinea, I think, um, among, the, among being in the list of countries targeted exactly. by the Global Fragility Act. So yeah, you did talk about it. Mozambique, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think they were in the number of countries in Africa. No, so yeah. Okay, let's see what happens. Uh, anyway, so the, well, you already mentioned that, uh, th that the United Nations Security Council cannot go into a country's internal affairs. It should only be mediating, I mean, the forces, at least UN forces, should only be mediating conflicts between two countries or more countries. But in this case, it's even worse than that because the United Nations Security Council, that resolution called this a non-UN mission, itself called it a non-UN mission. And so what does a non-UN mission, military mission, in, it is a UN member state. So what does a non-UN military mission in a UN member state mean? And it of course breaks the UN charter and uh, maybe a number of international conventions and many, many things. So if you would uh, elaborate on that, that what, what laws, what uh, international laws and conventions does a non-UN mission break? Okay, well, the first thing and maybe foremost is the Haitian constitution. In 1987, uh, it said very clearly, there will be no foreign military force ever established on Haitian soil. Now, already that has been violated twice in 94 and 2004, when uh, the US, France, and Canada intervened and then followed by UN military forces, which were brought in because their soldiers worked for half the cost, uh, primarily, and also provide good cover. Um, secondly, there is a chief justice in Kenya, uh, who has also uh, said that it is a violation of the Kenyan constitution for Kenyan troops to be sent there. And I think uh, as this moves into parliament, already we know that the Kenyan high court has postponed the deployment uh, for two weeks until October 24th. Um, it may actually cancel it altogether, but it is reviewing a challenge to the deployment uh, and said, nothing's going to happen until we rule. Now, that that same high court, in fact, appointed William Ruto in power. He was uh, came to power through an election which was quite contested. And so he was uh, Supreme Court <laughs> installed. So will they Will they uh, slap his wrist now or, or handcuff him now to uh, be part of this uh, US proxy scheme? We'll see. But um, so it does violate the, his, the, the Kenyan constitution, again, according to the former chief justice of Kenya, whose name escapes me, but you can find it in Haiti Liberté. And uh, thirdly, um, you know, the, the the UN was established precisely to stop these interventions uh, by uh, power by <laughs> uh, powers like the US, um, and I think that the the charter itself is is. Um, often uh, uh, sort of an abstraction to a lot of Americans now, uh, 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 almost 80 years after the Second World War, when the UN was founded. Um, and, you know, the charter was really trying to stop another world war. And so when you begin to have these precedents set through these neo-colonial um, maneuvers that the US is undertaking, it really creates the environment where you can see things like now the invasion of Israel into Palestine, 
uh, or uh, the invasion uh, or the um, uh, invasion of NATO into the areas around Russia, you know, forcing Russia to defend itself, uh, you can see um, sort of the instability that this um, precedent and this duplicity and this hypocrisy brings to the entire world and pushing us closer to the edge of war. So uh, world war, to a third world war. So to me, uh, you know, we might think of Haiti as sort of a backwater and sort of a sideshow and something which isn't really relevant to the current moment of um, international ferment. But in many ways, it is. It's the one providing the precedence. It's, it's been the country, the laboratory, as Haitians often call it, for uh, U.S. imperial uh, strategies to be uh, uh, devised and then tested. Thank you. Yes, uh, so yeah, we understand the importance of Haiti, uh, at least well, all the time. It, like it was always the same, uh, but uh, I mean, for centuries it has been the same. Test something in Haiti and then test it on the world. Yeah. Now, uh, we'll come back to the question on why the United States wanted to deputize or wanted a fig leaf, whatever, wanted a shield, and why it was particularly looking for an African country in order to lead this force, because you called it a blackface or a U.S.-Canadian effort. So why does the U.S. need this blackface? Well, um, you know, they, they always try to disguise themselves. And I, I think when Jamaica, which was their first choice, um, uh, backed away from it, um, they did try to go to Canada. Because Canada, uh, even though it's, you know, would be, again, a white face, uh, it, it um, has a, a not quite the uh, reputation, even though it's in, <laughs> engaged or uh, involved itself in at least two uh, uh, interventions in Haiti and, of course, multiple ones in uh, Asia, uh, from Afghanistan to Iraq, uh, et cetera. Uh, but it, it somehow is seen as a better cop, as a good cop. You know, it's it's not the U.S. So, um, but Canada also demurred. They didn't want it. According to Eve Engler, a Canadian analyst, it's because they felt Haiti was too small potatoes. They wanted a bigger, a bigger role. They wanted to be a bigger bad cop. Um, so that sent them over to Africa. And, you know, um, we see it with imperialism worldwide as the war on the third world has begun, that they, using this whole woke uh, ideology, uh, they've increasingly put uh, blackface into their leadership. I mean, Obama is the case, uh, Lloyd Austin, the defense minister now, Condoleezza Rice, um, uh, Colin Powell. Uh, we see it across the board. Uh, the uh, prime minister of England uh, is of Indian descent, I believe. Um, so we, we see this effort to take the people who have uh, are the descendants of uh, the, those who were enslaved or invaded or colonized and put them in front uh, to um, fool uh, the, the um, population. Uh, in New York City, we have a black mayor. Uh, many of the, much of the police force is black and Hispanic. Uh, so they, they found that the best way to really police and repress the uh, neo-colonies is to use other neo-colonies, use people that look like them. And so that's why Kenya worked out particularly well. And the Kenyans are uh, renowned. They're even an uh, object of great uh, concern to the UN. The UN Rapporteur on Human Rights has worried about the fact that in the month of July alone, 35 protesters were shot dead 
not only shot dead, but they were asked to not report the deaths or, or cover them up. Uh, they have death squads going on in Kenya. Uh, the um, uh, UN has had <laughs> meetings about their, their brutality and corruption uh, the, of, the, of the Kenyan police. So uh, we should, and, and they prove to be Kenya is kind of a, um, an Israel in Africa, if you will. We see its role in ECOWAS threatening the countries of Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, as they're breaking away from French colonialism, uh, neo-colonialism. So their president, William Ruto, is a, is a very good demagogue. You know, he talks a good game. If you start to listen to him, you think, wow, here's a, here's a fellow who's uh, anti-colonial, but he's, he's, he's just, you know, putting the, the sugar of anti-colonial uh, 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 rhetoric on top of his uh, pro-neo-colonial policies. And uh, so he's agreed to be the proxy, the lapdog, the handmaiden of U.S. imperialism. And again, we're hoping to find this um, document that was signed between Lloyd Austin minister there uh, back in September. And I, I think that, um, you know, we, we can expect that they'll do their best to recruit other uh, black faces to uh, help with this intervention. Jamaica has said it will participate, Barbados, Antigua, and Barbuda, um, and Bahamas. So, I mean, they're, they're small countries. They don't have a lot of forces to provide. Um, and it should be noted that Mutua said that this intervention is not going to take merely uh, uh, 1,000 cops or 1,100, it seems, uh, uh, one year to do. He said it's going to take three years, and it's going to require between 10 and 20,000 troops. Now, just to conclude, I think the end game, which they never tell you what their end goal is, is uh, given away by the Center for on Foreign Relations, the, the Council on Foreign Relations, which as many of Orinoco Tribune's listeners will know, is sort of the um, High Council of U.S. Imperialism, and they said that what is necessary is to make Haiti a ward of the United Nations, to make it a trust nation, put it under UN rule, which is, again, a euphemism for meaning a colony, to recolonize it. So they are looking to recolonize Haiti, and this is, at the end of the day, they will try to use as many neo-colonies to establish this all-out colony. Yeah, and it's actually a very, um, I think it's a characteristic of all uh, neo-colonies, at least the leaders of the neo-colonies, to use very anti-colonial language, because I have, I've been seeing it, I've been noticing it in case of India, which is a neo-colony, and a US, mm -hmm. this used to be a UK proxy, then a US proxy in South Asia, trying to create problems with the BRICS and everything. So it's, um, I, I mean, but by using very anti-colonial language. So yeah, it's a very, huh. it's a very common. It seems to be a very common thing across neo-colonies or at least their leaders. I'm not talking about the people, of course. So yeah. and uh, now, uh, since we're talking about gangs, because at least apparently these 20,000 soldiers would be fighting gangs for three years, etc. In Haiti, so you have like this. This is the general argument that is gang violence and the gangs are killing people and destroying whatever infrastructure and destroying everything. So the gang that has been mentioned, even uh, even in the UNSC discussions before, when you were when we actually invited you the last time, there was all this talk about sanctions on gangs and they were particularly mentioning G9 and the Jimmy Sherry's here, and you. 
at that time also, and in your in the film, in the documentary, and other vision, you had shown Sherry Sear as a different kind of person, as a sympathetic figure, a revolutionary figure, even who is trying to, uh, you know, try, who is actually fighting gangs. G9 is fighting gangs and is trying to broker a sort of deal among social movements in order to resolve uh, many of Haiti's pressing problems, you know, apart from gangs. So, how does this conflict? Then how does this uh, your your vision or you know, you know what you have seen in Haiti conflict with the way he is portrayed by the U.S. at the U.N. and other international forums and what implication might this have for a military intervention, which actually like his it said that its aim so called aim is to counteract gang violence in Haiti, but it only mentions G nine and the, this person its leader. Yes. Okay, uh, the first thing people need to understand about G9 is it is um, a very organic, autonomous movement. It was not the product of any party or any, um, you know, leadership, organized leadership from a political, from the political class. This, this was uh, uh, unusual uh, because so often uh, uh, revolutionary forces in the world, Latin America, Asia, Africa, have come out of organized political um, parties and sometimes networks which are based in Europe or the United States, and then they tried to germinate abroad. Uh, but this really came uh, uh, I could say independently of, of that. And we, as an as a as an example of an organized Marxist political force uh, based in the U.S. and Haiti, which um, has you know pushed for revolutionary change in Haiti for years, for decades, um, you know we saw and we were late in seeing it, but we finally did. Thank goodness, uh, you know uh, we. We saw that this was really what <laughs> Marx talked about. Here is a, a, an autonomous uprising which the revolutionary intelligentsia has to embrace and try to guide. Now, what's happening right now is they've put Cherizier and the G9 in a, between a rock and a hard place, as they say among <laughs> US miners, maybe uh, in other English speaking countries. And uh, his his dilemma is to go up against the U.S. Already this has happened because twice he's made challenges to Ariel Henry. And uh, when he does so, Ariel Henry funnels a lot more money, guns and uh, weapons, ammunition to the criminal gangs, and they attack him from behind. So he um, has the choice of confronting the imperialists who are in, going to invade uh, via the Kenyans um, and getting the criminal gangs shooting at him from behind, or to try to make peace with the criminal gangs and have them join him in fighting the imperialists. Because at the end of the day, They'll kill even those criminal gangs too. Um, you know, he chose the latter course or attempted it, and we thought it was uh, uh, the wrong move because one, it as they say in Creole, they have a saying, "Pote de l'eau moulin," bring water to the mill of the imperialists who tried to put all the armed groups in Haiti, both the criminal gangs and the groups fighting the criminal gangs in one sack called the gangs. So it makes it, 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 it makes them say, oh, you see, they're all together. Now Sherry Z is holding hands with the bad guys. Um, but uh, on the other hand, we feel it's very dangerous because those criminal gangs are purely motivated by money. They are as... Uh, <laughs> um, even Machiavelli pointed out in his great treatise of advice to princes in medieval Europe, he said, mercenaries are never reliable because they'll always flip and flop on you and they'll never fight really 
with any uh, heart. Uh, you know, they're only interested in money. So these uh, criminal gangs are very likely to betray you if you enter into an alliance with them. They'll they'll still stick a knife in your back or in your ribs, uh, even though they're nominally in alliance with you. So um, in a way, luckily, I think uh, this this alliance, which was called, or this truce, he called it, calls it a truce, not an alliance, but this truce, which was called Vivansam, Live Together, was announced on September 18th um, in a big march where he marched with in Delma, Lower Delma, that it was the neighborhood was called Bel Air, and sort of the political uh, representative of that neighborhood, who appears in our film, saying that Cherizier is the devil, he's the devil incarnate, he's the worst enemy of the Haitian people and of all humanity, who's marching arm in arm, side by side with Cherizier, uh, down the street, saying we're going to fight against the invaders and, and for revolution and so forth. Um, that was a beautiful image. We did an interview when we were there, as I said, at the end of August uh, with uh, Toto Alexand, as he's called, and Sherry which will be out soon. We trust on Redacted, uh, on the Redacted uh, YouTube channel. Um, but what happened was later that we, and I should say at the time, all the criminal gangs made declarations on the radio saying, listen, all the tolls, all the kidnappings, all the extortion, uh, all the bad things we were doing, that's stopping. We're all Haitians now, and one of the things motivating them was this canal struggle in the North, which has unleashed a great patriotic um, uh, upsurge among Haitians. So it was, a, you know, for a couple of days, and the 18th, the 19th, the 20th of September, everybody said, oh, my God, finally, the Haitian uh, family is once again united. And, of course, the motto on the Haitian flag is, union fait la force, unity makes strength. But then a few days later, on uh, September 22nd, one of the criminal gangs from Canaan called the Taliban, uh, and at the behest of another criminal gang called the Five Seconds Gang of Izo in Village de Dieu, went up to the town of Sodo and shot dozens of people, many to death, burned houses, burned cars and buses and trucks, stole cars and buses and trucks. And uh, then they went a couple days later to Mirabale, did the same thing. They met resistance. There was pushback in any case. The gangs went on a rampage. Why? Because there was apparently a shipment. Nobody knows quite what it was. The gangs aren't saying, the criminal gangs, uh, whether it was money or guns or drugs, I believe the latter is the case from the reports I've read. It sounds like it was a drug shipment which was intercepted. And uh, therefore, suddenly the idea of living together when the gangs were going to carry out these massacres on innocent civilians in the population, it, it just it showed that it, was, it wasn't going to happen. So the treachery of these criminal gangs was laid bare. And, and so um, Cherizier kind of let it drop. He didn't make an announcement saying, Viva Sam is dead. It's not going to work. Let's go backwards from that. But um, um, so the, the, the long and short of it is, yes, he is their principal target. And I would direct people to, again, the redacted channel where uh, Dan Cohen, uh, my colleague on the film, was contacted by a U.S. Special Forces, retired Special Forces soldier, Haitian-American called uh, Jean-Pierre Alfred. And he uh, explained, he was the one who told us and we told the world that U.S. Special Forces have been deployed to Haiti in great quantity. Uh, he said it was a, a deployment which was to make sure that nothing went wrong with it, uh, which probably will anyway. But uh, this deployment was sent in 
either to co-opt Cherizier, because they said that'd be great if we could win him over and then use him, uh, or to kill him. So it's kind of, uh, you know, we could either bribe you or kill you. Um, and uh, so we'll we'll be following this carefully. Um, they may have been waiting for the vote the, the, uh, of the UN. The interview was done prior to the vote, which happened on October 2nd. And um, in these last few days, uh, there has not been a lot more violence and fighting, but it's pretty clear that I think the, the notion of an alliance uh, against the um, intervention between the, the armed groups of Haiti is not going to fly. And then Cherizier will be forced to do what we think is the best, which is to ally with the people who sort of spontaneously organized. This has happened a couple of times. It happened from April to June of this year in sort of impromptu mobs armed with machetes called the Bois Calais, which means peeled wood. And what the peeled wood movements would do is they would go and they would find gang, criminal gang members, usually hold a sort of impromptu uh, tribunal, you know, look at his phone, go through his thing, you know, get people say, was he the guy who kidnapped your sister, whatever? Yeah, he's the guy, you know, that kind of thing. And then they dispatch them, usually with the machetes, burn the bodies and create a sort of a counter terror. Um, now, uh, as imperfect as this system is, um, this is the kind of force that, you know, I, I think the healthy uh, armed groups um, will need to rely on uh, if they are going to counter the uh, uh, Kenyan force and other forces coming in. And it's for sure to me, just to finish, that uh, the Kenyans are not going to be able to do it with 1,100 troops. You know, you have you have somewhere on the order of 13,000 armed people in Haiti, uh, uh, not under government control, um, and uh, in other words, gangs and uh, vigilance brigades. Um, uh, 13,000, I, I think I said 13,000 13, uh, versus 1,000 uh, 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 Kenyans with, I don't know, 50 or 60 special forces. The special forces say they're working with the cops to synergize the cops to, to do operations. I don't know if that's going to be feasible. The cops themselves are, are pretty discouraged. And many of them are, are uh, frankly, sympathetic to Cherizier, who is a former cop. Um, so, uh, and I spoke to a number of them when I was down there. We rode around with the cops, and many of them are quite sympathetic to Cherizier because you know they feel the same things he did. They feel they're just cannon fodder, that they're uh, uh, sacrificed to try to keep stability, uh, that they're tools, uh, pawns. And, you know, they resent it. So in any case, this is the scenario I could say for the coming battle, uh, if it ever happens, because as I say, maybe in people and the parliamentarians who are opposed to this uh, deal that Ruto has made with Washington to uh, be its poodle. Uh, so we'll see. Yes, I, I think I also read about this that a Kenyan court was blocking it, uh, blocking the deployment of Kenyan forces on the grounds of constitutionality or maybe inconstitutionality. Yeah. Um, hopefully, even if the right. no, if the block it, if the block it, then what is the US going to do? Like, I, I mean, if if it gets blocked in Kenya somehow, parliamentarians block it or court or both, then. Even if the United States United Nations resolution exists, it cannot go through, right? So what will the US then who will the right. US look to? Right. No, it can't go through. The US Okay, okay. 
Oh, yeah, you are back. Uh, for for some minutes, it was just lost, but yeah, you are back. So, who will the US choose next okay. as a proxy or whatever? Say it again. Who will the US choose as a proxy next? If not oh, today? next. Oh, um, I don't know. Maybe Taiwan would be available. I don't. <laughs> uh, yeah. That, no, is, that, I'm, is, I'm, that I'm is a kidding. joke, of course. <laughs> yes, of course, because, that's a joke. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I don't want to get you in any trouble there, Sahil. Um, <laughs> no, um, I, you know, I, I really don't know. I don't see where else, where next they can turn. And this will be a huge blow uh, to their plan if the Kenyans are unable to come. Um, I, I I really don't see it's possible, you know, one of their other big allies is Rwanda, you know, Kagame is, uh, you know, very close with the Americans since they helped get him into power decades ago. Um, but I don't think he has the same force. He doesn't have the same size uh, that the Kenyan uh, army has and uh, the um police force. So, you know, I, I think it, 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 it really could stop the whole thing at its tracks. And I hope it does happen like that. Uh, as when we, we, we had a conference call with, uh, as I said, this Babu Owimo, Owino, who is a, a, a fairly uh, prominent opposition figure in Kenya, and he said that there was a 102% chance that they would be able to block the deployment in the Kenyan parliament. So I don't know. I, I hope he's right. Uh, but uh, at this point, that would be a, just a tremendous um, uh, what in Creole they call serum, which is serum, like a shot in the arm uh, to the resistance movement in Haiti. And combined with the uprising of the Palestinians, I mean, this this is kind of a dream come true. You know, if you would have the Palestinian uprising, the Haitian uprising, I don't know, many other countries, uh, if, you, if we recall in 2019, the entire planet was standing up in India, uh, everywhere. There were just huge demonstrations and I, I think it would be a, a, a really wonderful thing to see the entire planet in conjunction with the emergence of this multipolar world and the new reserve currency, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that the, all the neo colonies rise up at once and say no more to what we've been enduring these past decades. Mm -hmm. So now we'll be coming to the question that everybody has been asking since the day of the vote. And it was that Russia and China both abstained. Um, but when the same discussion had been happening, like Haiti was in the discussion for a long time in the United Nations Security Council. And in all the time, in both these two countries were very opposed to uh, deploying forces in Haiti or deploying uh, anything, like deploying a UN Security Council mission in Haiti. So they were both opposed. They had said it many times that they would not support it. But on the day of the on the day of the vote, the actual vote, although it was expected that they either one or both would veto it, neither did. Both abstained. I think both countries gave out statements talking about why they did it. But why do you think that these two countries did not veto and like just abstained? Uh, you know. Like why? Why would they not use their power to stop it? Okay. Um, uh, again, I think it goes back to uh, what we learned from one of our Russian contacts, which said it wasn't part of Russia's core interests. And I think the same thing was true for China. Uh, one thing it has to be remembered that China has huge uh, Belt and Road Initiative um, projects that it's undertaken in Kenya, which has been a big Belt and Road um, partner. Uh, so they may not have wanted to sort of slap the Kenyans. Uh, and the Russians, 
they had just used their vote, as I say, their veto to stop the uh, Mali resolution a few weeks earlier, about two weeks earlier. And the US propaganda machine, as much as the empire is taking a nosedive right now, uh, is still very strong. And the repetition of the drama that Haitians are living through, uh, to, and they come with a lot of figures, many of which I question, uh, as Mark Twain said, a lot, <laughs> three types of an untruth, lies, damn lies, and statistics. But they say there are 200,000 people who are displaced. They say there have been 2,700 people uh, killed. Uh, in this past year, that there are, um, you know, uh, whatever percentage of the population is facing starvation. So they're creating the picture of this humanitarian catastrophe. And I think Russia and China, neither of them wanted to get into, um, as, you know, we say in the U.S., a pissing match with the U.S. as which would surely come if they'd put the veto to say, oh, you see them, they're using their geopolitical uh, interests to sacrifice the Haitian people. They don't care about Haiti and et cetera. So they, they didn't want to be portrayed as insensitive to the ordeal that Haitians are going through now. So to me, in many ways, their uh, abstentions were a reflection of that this was just one battle, which they didn't want to take on since they're already in big battles over Ukraine, over Taiwan, over uh, a myriad of other uh, issues uh, with the US. And so this one, they just said, okay, <laughs> we, 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 we've, made our, we, we've made our position clear, but we're not going to go to the mat with you on it. Yeah, I think uh, I think the UN, sorry, the Russian uh, prominent representative in the UN said something similar in different language, in different words, diplomatic words, but he probably said something yeah. similar that uh, that we are we just showed our position that we are not in agreement, etc. Mm. So yeah. and uh, I think it was Dan Cohen who said that. Uh, uh, even if uh, Russia or China or both had vetoed, it would st the invasion would still have gone through because there are already U.S. special forces there, and there will be more. So, like whatever happens, there, uh, like the U.S. is bent upon the invasion. That they will do it. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. No. They would have come in anyway, uh, and they might have. You know what they did in 1983 uh, in Grenada when they wanted to intervene. UN wouldn't agree and the OAS wouldn't agree. So they just made uh, kind of a coalition of the willing at the time. Uh, you know, they call it, they give it a name and they get a few countries in in the Caribbean. At that time in the invasion of, of uh, Grenada, it was Dominica, which was leading it, uh, headed by a woman called Eugenia Charles. And she was the she was the person who spoke about it, who led it. You know, they made it look like it was a Caribbean intervention when it was all U.S. So uh, they would find a way to to gussy it up. But of course, the U.N. is the gold standard for fig leaves. So. Okay. Now, uh, I think this will. I mean, we'll wrap up with uh, the most important question which is that if the UN mission goes through, or even, oh, it's a non-UN mission, but anyway, even if this UN, so-called UN mission goes through, or if it does not, but the US still invades in some other way. So how would this mission or any future possible mission impact the life of lives of Haitians? That's the most important thing that they're always talked about as peace in Haiti, stability in Haiti, political stability, et cetera. Now, uh, military missions generally do not bring these things. So what do you think would be the impact on the lives of the people of Haiti? Well, with the <laughs> Kenyans, it's going to be terrible. We have a, a the, the, the picture uh, on our Haiti Liberté article this week um, about the, the, the 
MSS project, uh, you know, has a picture of a Kenyan policeman stomping on a prone demonstrator's head. Um, and this seems to be par for the course for the Kenyans. So you imagine this troop, tr these troops uh, going into uh, not a country that are their country men and women uh, is sharing the same language. They don't, they don't know Haiti. They don't understand the culture. They don't understand the language. And so they are just going to be uh, <laughs> going blind and scared. And, you know, the, the, the flip side of fear is anger. And, you know, before long, you're going to see them just going willy-nilly crazy on Haitians. So I think if it does happen, we're going to see massacres. Uh, that, that, to me, is guaranteed. We're going to see, um, you know, the same sort of sexual predation that that the uh, UN troops did. I mean, these are young men, you know, and they got crazy testosterone going. They're going to go nuts in 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 the, these these uh, shanty towns, which is what happened uh, under both occupations in '94 and 2004. Uh, we're going to see a lot of um, uh, uh, I, I could say just battles in uh, shanty towns because all of these areas of Port-au-Prince where you have uh, either the vigilance brigades of the G9 or the criminal gangs are densely, densely packed. So if you're having a battle in them trying to root out the bad guys, a lot, a lot of innocent men, women, and children are going to be killed in the process. So I think, um, you know, it's just a recipe for disaster. You're sending in the most brutal, ill-equipped people. I mean, even if you've gotten French-speaking troops, um, you know, that's unlikely since they're all liberating themselves now from Mali or Burkina Faso, say, uh, you know, there might be a modicum of communication. Uh, but there's going to be nothing going on. They, they, they don't speak Swahili, uh, the Haitians, uh, and the Kenyans don't speak Creole or French. So it's, it's just going to be a terrible, terrible scene if it happens. And uh, what about Haiti's infrastructure? Like it is already damaged from many things, earthquakes. Oh, yeah. So like, what is going to happen to that? I, I wouldn't imagine. So it yeah. probably does not exist. You would know better than me. I can just imagine that it does not exist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. No, it doesn't. No, it's it's going to be um, just, uh, I, 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 I really hope that the Kenyans put the kibosh on it. Yeah. Okay. So if, if there is anything important that I have missed, but that you think, that you consider important, so you could just talk about that regarding this situation or what other follow-up? Yeah, no, the only last there. word I, the last word I would say is, um, you know, this canal question, what's happening in the north is um, uh, really bringing Haitians together. It's creating a new sort of patriotic consciousness goal where Haitians are seeing that if they put themselves, you know, this canal was built basically without any government help. This was the local population just taking their resources and putting it together and going out and volunteering to build it. You know, it's a little bit like in Cuba, how like in the Pan American Games in 1991 or two in the middle of the special period in Cuba when they had, um, you know, <laughs> just terrible famine sweeping the country, but people came out and with voluntary labor, they built the city for the Pan American Games uh, in Cuba. This is a little bit what we're seeing on a smaller scale and less organized by, by the state. I mean, the state's not involved at all, happening in Haiti. And so this is creating a sense of pride, patriotism, and national unity uh, and I think that 
this is going to help the struggle of the Haitian people to resist this occupation and um, you know, hopefully bring about a uh, progressive change that uh, the Haitian people so eagerly want. So uh, do you see any political solution to this, like political solution to Haiti's crisis? I, do, I don't see a negotiated one. I don't think no, any negotiation, all these uh, <clears throat> and meetings they're having in Jamaica, and maybe there'll be one in Bahamas, and they might have one in the States. I don't know. This is, you know, as, as somebody once said, a lot of people think that uh, <laughs> class struggle is based on a uh, on a misunderstanding. No, there's no misunderstanding here. These are class interests which are confronting each other. And um, this is really uh, decades, even centuries of exploitation, colonialism and oppression uh, coming to a head. So Thanks a lot for all your uh, answer responses. I mean, they covered many things that I did not ask, but yeah, still, the, I think we should have a part three, like you would say, probably, because we are looking at what might happen. I mean, we were actually looking at Haiti for some time just before this Palestine thing exploded. So probably the two things will go on in parallel, or maybe uh, the US might not invade Haiti at the moment, as, until and unless they can resolve the crisis in the Middle East. So let's just wait and see. But uh, thanks a lot for coming. I mean, uh, using your morning, I think. And uh, it's probably afternoon. Uh, so thank you very much. And we will have a part three very soon. We'll see. OK. Well, Sahali, thank you very much, as usual, for your uh, incisive questions. And um, uh, yeah, I look forward to talking to you again, uh, our, our, our uh, sister publication, Orinoco, Orinoco Tribune. Okay, that's very nice to hear.